If you have your Bibles, turn, if you will, to Deuteronomy again. We were here last week, Deuteronomy chapter 13, verse 6 through verse number 11. We were reading this last week. I want to continue the thought of seriously, seriously, because you've got, you got to say it right. You know, you've got to go, seriously? Uh, I was talking with Gary and Larry back there before Sunday school, and Gary said, what you going to preach on today and I said same thing did last Sunday he said uh, what was that I said seriously <laughs> he said well, I can't remember seriously and Larry said he didn't know either and then about that time uh, Gary got the big idea and said picking up sticks I said seriously <laughs> and finally I told him I said I preached on seriously That's right. Amen. So I want us to think on seriously, seriously again today. Let's read our text again and then bring you up to speed and get into new ground quickly. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 13, verse 6, If thy brother, the son of thy mother, or thy son, or thy daughter, or the wife of thy bosom, or thy friend, which is thine own soul, entice thee secretly, saying, Let us go and serve other gods, which thou hast not known, thou nor thy fathers, namely the gods of the people which are around about you, nigh unto thee, or far off from thee, from one end of the earth unto the other end of the earth. Thou shalt not consent unto him, nor hearken unto him, neither shall thine eye pity him, neither shalt thou, or neither shalt thou spare, neither shalt thou conceal him. Thou shalt surely kill him with thine hand, or excuse me, thy hands shall be first upon him to put him to death, and afterwards the hands of all the people. And thou shalt stone him with stones that he die, because he hath sought to thrust thee away from the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. And all of Israel shall hear and fear, and shall do no more any such wickedness as this is among you. I asked you last week if you felt like God was sincere in this or God was just saying that, and God was sincere, wasn't He? God was sincere. I even mentioned last week that that sounds harsh, that sounds bad, but if they would have listened to God, it would have saved so much death, so much destruction, so much disappointment had only they listened to do what God says. I hope you called a couple of things last week. One thing that I mentioned last week that I hope that is living in your heart is what a person believes about sin reveals what they think about God. Your ideal of sin will have lots to do with your ideal about God. If you don't think sin's that big of a deal, then you don't think God's that big of a deal. It goes together. What you think about sin has to do with what you think about God. You say, well, I'm glad that when Jesus came to earth, which was God in the flesh here on the earth, He didn't teach such things. Well, remember, He said, if your eye offend thee, pluck it out. If your foot offends you, cut it off. If your hand offends you, cut it off. He said, better off to go through life halt and main than to go into eternity without God. So God hadn't changed His message on sin. God hates sin because of what sin does to people. I said last Sunday that this looks harsh. This this is what makes a lot of people say, well, if that's your God, I want nothing to do with Him. But you and I that are saved today, believers, know that God is a God of love. And God did this out of love. Uh, You know, I used to have to spank my children. I loved them, and I wanted them to do right. And I had to give them spankings. And the Bible teaches us that we ought to do that. If we love them, we correct our children. And uh, so God corrects us. He loves us. He corrects us. God always gives us truth. He doesn't tell us something that's not true, but it is always true. So we were looking at some of these things last week, but I want us to go on now and look at our text. And hopefully this morning we'll have time to also put it into our church and into our own lives as well. So look, if you will, back in verse number 6. I want to say something, first of all, about relationships relationships he says if thy brother the son of thy mother or thy son or thy daughter or the wife of thy bosom or thy friend which is as thine own soul 
So he begins this passage here, this text we're reading from, and he's talking about relationships. Now, we all know the importance of relationships. We know uh, the importance of a mother and a father and children. We know the importance of being uh, grandparents and all that. Relationships makes our lives so much fuller. I used to think that when I was a young boy, I used to watch old Grizzly Adams, you know, living up there in the mountains with the old bear Ben and number seven, the donkey, and that old guy coming by, and I thought, that's the life for me. I'd love to live up there in those mountains and just live in those mountains, but I probably had about two weeks up there. I'd be running down from running down the mountain headed for Sugarloaf. I want to be around people. Relationships is what makes our place of living so much better. You know, I can drive down the road and I see places and I think, I don't think I'd want to live here. I just don't like the way it looks and I think I'd rather live somewhere else. But it's not so much about what it looks like and, and what we see. It's about the people that are around us. Relationships make such a, a difference in our lives. And we all know the importance of relationships. And verse number 6, he is talking about relationships. But also he's talking about the endeavors, not only the importance, but the endeavors in our relationship. You say, what do you mean by that? Well, if you had a wife or you had a son or a daughter, you had a husband or whatever that relationship was, your best friend, and you knew, you knew that if he, he or she done this, you would have to report it and you would have to be the first one to throw the stone. What would you do? What would you do? I believe that you'd do everything in your power to make sure they don't do that. You'd make sure your children knew what God said. You'd want to make sure that that husband, that wife, knew what God said. And you'd want to try the best you could to keep them from being stoned. And you certainly do not want to be the man that had to throw or the woman that had to throw the first stone. You inde- you, in, relationships are important. And when you knew what God said, you would endeavor endeavor to try to make sure that this didn't happen in your home or in your family. So there's the importance of the relationships. There's the endeavors that would be built into the relationship. And then there's the environment for these relationships. We'd want to make sure that they went to the right places. We'd want to make sure they hung around the right people. We'd want to make sure they got the right information. We'd want to do everything in our power because family is so important. Our best friends are that important that we'd want to do everything we could to make sure that they wouldn't be stoned. We wouldn't want that. It'd break our hearts to think about stoning a son or a daughter. It'd break our hearts to think about stoning a wife or a wife. I don't know if a wife had that authority in that day to stone or not, but it'd be horrible to have to stone a loved one because that they were trying to entice you from going away from God. So he begins in verse number 6 with relationships. Then he goes down to verse number 6 and verse number 7, the latter part of 6 and 7. And he talks about rebellion. Rebellion. Notice what he says here. He says, If they come unto thee secretly, saying, Let us go and serve other gods, which thou hast not known, thou nor thy fathers, namely the gods of the people which are round about you, nigh unto thee, or far off from thee, from the one end of the earth, even unto the other end of the earth. So he's talking about rebellion. The common characteristic in rebellion is secretly. Whoever this is that God is speaking of here that uh, could have done this, it could have been the wife, could have been the husband, a child, mother, whatever it was, they came secretly. You remember in the garden when Eve was deceived by Satan, he came to her secretly. Adam was not there and he appeared to her secretly. You've got to be careful when things are done undercover. People begin whispering secrets in your ear. A lot of times that is a sign that something's wrong. And it also tells me that the person that's doing this knows what they're doing is wrong. They know that this is wrong. They know it goes against the commandments of God. They know it goes against the law of God or they wouldn't have been ashamed of it. They would have just went and approached the whole family and yelled it out. But they're coming secretly. So they know that they're wrong in what they're doing. That is a a common characteristic in rebellion. But then I noticed the conversation concerning the rebellion. They're trying to take someone out and getting them to go worship false gods. You know, it ain't no fun to be in sin by yourself. 
It just isn't any fun. You need to find somebody that you can identify with, and you want to pull them down to your level. That's the way sin works. You want to pull people down to your level, and that's what they're trying to do here. They know it's wrong, but they're trying to pull down that brother or sister. They're trying to pull down that son or daughter or that uh, mother or father. They're trying to pull them down. They've come secretly, and they're trying to get them to do what God has commanded them not to do. But then we notice not only the, the characteristic and then the, uh, the conversation, but notice the commandment condemning the rebellion. Look in Deuteronomy chapter number 12, verse 1 through 3. Moses here, speaking on behalf of God, says this, These are the statutes and the judgments, and ye shall observe to do in the land, which the Lord God of thy fathers giveth thee to possess, all the days ye live upon the earth. Ye shall utterly destroy all the places wherein the nations which ye shall possess serve their gods upon the mountains and upon the hills and under every green tree. Ye shall overthrow their altars, break down their pillars, burn their groves with fire, and ye shall hew down the graven images of their god and destroy the names of them out of that place. So we notice that God has been up front. God has been fair. God in His loving characteristic has told them not to do it, but if someone does, that person is to die. So there's the relationship. There's the rebellion. Down in verse number 8, there's the response. Notice what He said. Thou shalt not consent unto Him, nor hearken unto Him, neither shalt thine eye pity Him, neither shalt thou spare, neither shalt thou conceal Him. This is your wife. This is your son. This is your brother. This is a friend that you noticed, that you grew up with and knew all your life. But you'll notice in verse number 7, they were to do faithfully what God said. It's not easy always to do what God says. It goes against the grain. And especially if Satan can tempt us to think that God don't know what he's talking about. If Satan can put in our minds that that's mean and, and we can't do that. But you notice in verse number 8, they are to do faithfully what God said. God said that, and God meant that. But you'll also believe, I believe you could see in verse number 8, that they would do sorrowfully for what God said. They're not going to take no pride in this. This is not something that's going to make them happy. But this is something that God has told them to do. That's why I said that you would do everything you could to make sure that son, that daughter, uh, that husband, that wife, you'd do everything in your power that you could to make sure they would never yield to such a thing because when they do, it's too late. So that's what what I'm looking at here. It's sorrowful. It It doesn't bring God pleasure. The Bible says that God has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. But God in His wisdom knows that if it's not stopped, it'll continue and it'll affect more people down the road. So they were to do faithfully what God said. They would do it sorrowfully because God said it. And then again, they would do it openly because that's what God said to do. Wouldn't that be awful to have to go down there and say, This is my son, and he tried to get me to go out and worship idols. They've been worshiping idols up there in the groves, and, and they want me to go out there. And, and you've got to confess that. You've got to bring that to to those, uh, the judges and all of those that are there. And uh, I mean... It's tough. It's tough. But that's what God told Israel to do. There's the relationships, the rebellion, the response. Verse number 9 through 10, the removal. The removal. I think you'll notice in verse number 9, it was a fatal sin. He was to be killed. That daughter was to be killed. That wife, that best friend, they had to be killed. It was a fatal sin. Sin leads to death. But then there was the first stone. If it was your son or your daughter, you had to throw the first stone. If it was your wife or your best friend, you had to throw that first stone. Man, wouldn't that make you want to be a good daddy? Wouldn't that make you want to be a good mama? Wouldn't that make you want to be a good child? I mean, they had to throw the first stone. I, like I said last week, I don't know of anywhere in the Bible where they ever kept it. And, of course, it caused them a lot in the future after this, all kinds of problems. But they had to throw the first stone. 
I couldn't imagine that. It was a fatal sin. That was the first stone. And then there's the following scene in the latter part of verse number 9 and verse number 10. Here comes the neighbors. Here comes the other people. Here comes the elders who all was involved. And they kept throwing stones until that person was dead. And that's sad. Now, this is not nothing that pleases God. This doesn't tickle God. God's not up in heaven a laughing. God's a looking with a heart that's broken. He has, he has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. God would want them to live right and done right. But if they're not going to do that, they're going to take more and more and more with them. And that's exactly what happened if you continue reading the Bible forward. Notice the results of this in verse number 11. The Bible talks about the hearing of God's people and all of Israel shall hear. Fear. They won't do that. They're not going to say that. They're not going to go do that because they fear. They fear. The hearing of God's people, the fearing of God's people, and the turning of God's people. All of that's in verse number 11. Israel shall hear and fear and shall do no more such wickedness as this among them. So there was a, this not only stopped the person that was wanting to take the family away from God and to idols, but it's also keeping others from going down that road. But think about what that would be like. Think about throwing that stone at that son or that daughter. Think about throwing that stone at that wife or that best friend. It breaks your heart to think about that. But this is what God was telling Israel to do. Sin that isn't stopped, if it's not stopped, will continue. You know a brown recluse, I think I said that right, spider? When they bite you, it's just a little tiny dot. But if you don't do something about it, it just keeps taking your skin, taking your skin, taking your skin. Eventually it'll kill you. And sin has to be stopped. It has to be stopped. If it's not stopped, then it will continue. It always has and it always will. When Adam and and Eve sinned in the garden, there was a lamb that was slain. You and I know that that lamb was a picture of Jesus Christ. God's Son was going to have to die on Calvary to stop this thing of sin. It took the death of His Son on an old rugged cross, dying for you and dying for me. The Bible says that when believers, we are saved, we are baptized into Christ. We've been baptized into His death, into His resurrection. We become a new creature. There has to be a death in us, a spiritual death, in order to live the life that God wants us to. To live. The only remedy, remedy for sin is death. Does not the flood prove that? Does not the tower of Babel prove that? The nation of Israel, how they lost their, their significance and went for many, many years without even being recognized as a nation. There are as the valley of bones, Ezekiel, I believe it is, or Jeremiah speaks of. The apostasy of the church. Sin ends in Death. It ends in death. So how I, I'm thankful and I'm grateful that we don't have to carry out that law today. And I think everybody would say, Amen. We don't want to. We don't want to stone our loved ones. That would break our hearts. We wouldn't want to do that. So, so how, does, how does this work with us today? Well, let me say something concerning the church. Look, if you will, at First Timothy for just a moment. First Timothy, chapter number 5. 1 Timothy chapter number 5, and look down to verse number 20. I think you can see how this signifies or goes along with the church. Now, we're not going to stone nobody. We're not going to stone anybody. But there is a, a lesson to be learned from that that applies, I believe, to the New Testament church. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse number 20. The Bible says, Them that sin rebuke, before all. You don't cover it. You don't conceal it. But you take care of it. Look at the mess that's happened in some of the denominations of our church sins that had been covered for years and years knowing that they were doing these things and moving them to other states and moving them to other churches concealing sin. And not only just maybe greed and stuff like that, but we're talking molestation and and all of that kind of stuff, covering it up. 
You don't cover up sin. You have got to expose sin and deal with sin. He said that them that sin rebuke before all. If it's wrong, it's wrong. That, what, what did he say in the law? Let the, the husband throw the rock at the wife and the, the first one and uh, the son or daughter, however it was in those situations. Here he's telling Paul's writing to Timothy here, and he says that sin must be rebuked. It must be taken care of. You can't conceal it and just cover it up. Why? That others may fear. Is that not what God said about the stoning? That others will hear that and fear? Sin, sin cannot be covered, but in our day we do a lot of covering sin. Verse 21 says, I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that thou observe these things without preferring one another, doing nothing by partiality. We've got the Bible, we've got God's Word, and we need to use God's Word in these matters. If God says it's wrong, it's wrong. And we don't use partiality. We don't let some get by with it, and others we don't. We don't run down one and brag on another. We, sin is sin. makes no difference who does it. If God says it's wrong, it's wrong. And it has to be taken care of. And it's done because we know what sin will do. We know what the Bible says. And we do it out of par, not out of partiality. He says in verse 22, Lay hands suddenly on no man. Make sure. Make sure what you do. Neither be partakers of other man's sin. Why? Because it'll destroy you. It'll destroy a church. Sin will destroy what God wants to do. Then he says in the latter part of verse 22, keep thyself pure. So you see that's a, a, a picture of what we just read back in Deuteronomy. It must be stopped. It can't be allowed to spread. You've got to take care of it. If you don't, it's just going to keep getting worse and worse. And you know as well as I do that the church is going to end up in apostasy in these last days. Why would the church end up in apostasy? Because the Bible says they keep turning away their ears from the truth. They want to hear fables. They want to hear things that's pleasing. And nobody wants to take responsibility. Nobody wants to preach the Bible. And the church gets further away from God. And when you get further away from God, you get deeper into sin. And that's what happens. So the Old Testament principle in a church setting. But what about a family setting? What about a Christian? How could we apply this text to us? Well, first of all, I want to say our families are important, aren't they? We love our families. We love our children. We love our grandchildren. We love our friends. We, I hope here at Oakdale we love one another. I mean, love is the greatest of all these things, Paul says, when it comes to, to faith and hope. There's just nothing no greater than love. And we love our families. And because we love our families, we ought to try to do our best to prioritize spiritual things. Because you see, if that son or that daughter doesn't come to Christ, and they stay out in the world and, and live for the world and want nothing to do with God, there's something worse than stoning. As terrible as stoning is, there's something worse than stoning. There's a godless place. There's a dark place. There's a place called hell. And we want to do the best we can to make sure that that son, that daughter, that grandchild, we want to do everything we can to make sure, make sure that they don't end up in a godless eternity. Sure, stoning is bad. But at lo I don't know how long a stoning would take to kill people. I mean, I hope if I was ever stoned, I want somebody to throw a big one in a hurry, don't you? I want to get it over with. But you can't do that in hell. They're still in hell, begging. The rich man's still in hell, begging for water. Hell is full of people, and they've been there for some 6,000 years, and, and it's going to continue on forever. And so those today that go to hell are going to be there to the great white throne judgment and then be thrown into the lake of fire. And they're going to be there forever and forever. So there is something worse than stoning. And because of that, we want to do our best because family is important. To let them know the truth and try to do everything we can to make sure that they don't want to go that route. Not only is families important, but 
as Christians, we know that sin is our greatest enemy. Sin is the greatest enemy we have as Christians. Boy, if we would treat sin like we did COVID, boy, our families would be a lot different, wouldn't they? If we treat sin like we do the common seasonal flu, it'd make a difference in our lives. It's amazing how we get on this train and that train and we take everything so serious and so important and we lose. We lose sight of how deadly, devastating, and terrible sin really is. Jesus left heaven to come to this earth because of sin. That's how important it is. God said it is so important in the Old Testament that this be stopped unless they drag others out into that. That this is something you have to do and it'll break your heart. But if you don't do it, it's going to just continue on. But think there's something worse than a stoning. And that is to die without God and to be in eternity forever, forever, and forever. Oh my, we ought to want to do everything we can to try to make sure that our family knows the Lord. Families are important. Sin is our greatest enemy. Do all you can. Do all you can to make sure that your family will never face the wrath of God. Have a neighbor said something to me one day, and it haunts me. I think about it a lot. She never had no children. Never was able to have a child. And uh, we was talking one day, and she said, Well, the Lord... Never let us have any children. But she said, you know, I would rather went through life without a child than to have a child. And that child never know Jesus. Well, that's the right ideal about sin. That's the right ideal about serious. That's the right ideal. Isn't that right? Could they be anything any worse than knowing that your son or your daughter, your husband or your wife, your best friend would die lost without God. There's nothing. Jesus told Judas, he said, it would be better off, Judas, if you had never been born. Now, he wasn't saying that just because he denied Jesus and took 30 pieces of silver and all. He didn't say that. The reason he said it was because Judas went into an endless eternity without God as his Savior. It is serious. It is serious. And let me say this lastly. You need to stay faithful to God, even if your loved ones don't. I've known people, it seemed like when their family went haywire, they just threw up their hands and went haywire with them. But even if your friends and your family don't want nothing to do with God, you need to stay faithful. You need to stay faithful. You need to stay with God. And maybe somewhere down the road, they'll come to their right mind and they'll look to Christ and be saved I've had people tell me that I was crazy I'm not going to call no names some of y'all are sliding down the seat I was, I'm kidding I had people call me crazy but I got to reading one day where an old demoniac come to Jesus when he came he was naked and sleeping up in the graveyards, his life was a mess. Sin messed him up. But when God got done with him, the Bible said he was sitting there with clothes on and in his right mind. So now some people would say, Preacher, I just don't agree with what you're saying, and there's thousands and thousands, millions of people out here that wouldn't agree with me at all. But I think I'm telling it the truth. This is serious. Serious. Serious than stoning when you think about it much more serious so God help us to do the best we can to make sure that everybody we know is ready to meet Jesus and if they want nothing to do with Jesus you plow on don't let up don't back up you stay with God and do the best you can and maybe one day they'll come around before it's too late father I thank you for the word of God I know these verses are difficult and they can be hard, but God, Satan, would want us to think that you sure are a mean God and uh, you you're just ain't fair and you're tough. But 
Lord, what you did, you came and died so we wouldn't have to die. You took the stoning for us on Calvary's cross. You took the wrath of God that one day we could take the way of heaven. It's not your will that any perish, but that all would be saved. Lord, maybe here this morning there's folks that have never been saved, never been changed by God. They can't really say in their heart they love you and they want to try to grow and their faith and, and learn more about God and, and try to uh, be a witness for God. They've never, had, they've never experienced that change. But Lord, this morning you're dealing with their heart. They know they're lost and they need to be saved. God, to pray today they'll open up their heart and let the Savior in. Maybe some here today we've just kind of got to where we don't think of sin as bad as we ought to. We know it's there. We know it's wrong. God, we don't hate it like we ought to hate it. I pray that you would refresh that in our hearts and in our lives. Maybe some here that have wayward friends and wayward family and they want nothing to do with God. God, they may be a thinking about just giving in to them. God, help them. Help them to stay with Jesus. To do what's right in every way. To be a witness. We won't be the only Bible that some will ever read. God, help us to do right. Whatever you want to do, may we open our hearts and let you have your way as we close this service out. In Jesus' name, amen.